All right, so our first session for today is um, I'm going to present the presenter and then my uh, colleague VSJ is going to talk about the session. Is Dr. Nikki Ashcroft. You have seen Nikki before as she presented for uh, the newly established Professional Council of Membership. So Dr. Nikki is an associate teaching professor in the online master's education TESOL program at the University of Missouri. She has been a member of the TESO International Association for stunning 28 consecutive years. <laughs> and during her career, she has also been a member of Max TESOL, TESOL Arabia, Georgia TESOL, and Tex TESOL 5. She currently serves on TESO International's Awards Professional Council, where she coordinates the Virginia French Allen Award for Scholarship and Service to TESO International affiliates. Dr. Ashraf is the incoming chair of the TESO International's newly established Membership Professional Council. Welcome, Nikki. Uh, VSJ, would you like to tell us about the session? You're muted. I can launch right into it. <laughs> no, she's there. She's ready. Nikki, Nikki, please go straight into your session. Great. That was a great introduction. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. I'll just go ahead and uh, start doing a share screen then. Sure. Yeah. All right, so I hope everyone can see it. And can everyone hear me all right? Yes, okay, good, thank you. So yes, this, this presentation is on engaging future professionals. And by that, I'm referring to student members and how can the different language teacher associations facilitate the involvement of student members. So before I get into the very meat of the presentation, I want you to think about, do you remember when you were a student and you were studying to be an English teacher and you were so excited to launch into this new profession? Um, I remember when I was a student uh, studying for a master's at Georgia State University and one day, one of my professors came into class and had a stack of papers, because this was some years ago, had a stack of papers that the professor handed out to everyone that was an application for the TESOL International Association. And my professor told us, you know, this is our professional association. And if you are planning to have a career in TESOL and you are going to be a professional, then you need to join the TESOL International Association. So of course, as a student, I wanted to be a professional. And so I also wanted to follow my uh, professor's advice because uh, I was a good student. And so I, I immediately applied to join TESOL International and I have been a member ever since. Um, and I was very lucky that the following spring, the uh, TESOL International Convention was held in Atlanta in 1993. And I was able to attend that. And I was really just in awe. Of course, you know, one, I got to hear all these you know, famous speakers that I had been reading about in my classes, but also just to see the thousands of teachers from all around the world and to know that they are all English teachers, just like me, and that I was part of this community. So it was really a, 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 a very formative moment in the development of my professional identity. And so um, I think um, as, as people who are leaders in different language teacher associations, we, we shouldn't forget those student members and how excited they are to be a part of our organization and to join our profession. So I um, became curious to know how are language teacher associations engaging with their student members? So how do they recruit their student members? Um, how do they involve student members in different association activities? And also we know that you know, student members have different needs than other members, you know, different needs in that they are new to the profession. They're still learning, they're, they're feeling their way and learning their way um, into our profession. So how are language teacher associations meeting the unique needs that student members have given their status of students? So I decided to do some research on this issue. And what I'm going to be presenting to you today are the findings of this research. So what I did, is I identified who are the affiliates 
um, in the United States, and I had to narrow it down to United States because there are actually like so many language teacher associations around the world, but just to be manageable, I narrowed it down to language teacher associations in the United States that are affiliated with TESOL International, with the National Association of Bilingual Education, and also with ACTFL, the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages. And so these are um, very large organizations that we are um, most, most of us are probably familiar with. And um, I thought that by focusing on the affiliates of these larger organizations, that I would be able to um, cover the entire geographic scope of, of the United States, which I did. Um, and also to include um, associations that dealt with second languages, foreign languages, and also bilingual education. So through this um, sampling, I, I ended up identifying 124 language teacher associations. Um, and then I um, just have classified them here, um, again, within the context of the United States, which ones were more focused on teaching second language, which ones were teaching um, foreign language, and which ones were looking at the development of two languages, an L1 and an L2, in the same learner population. Um, so I was able to cover um, all of the um, 50 United States, and you see there was a, um, a wide um, range of um, languages covered as well. So um, how did I collect data about these organizations? Um, I looked at the publicly available information on their websites. So again, I you know, pulled up all the affiliate list of um, those organizations and I looked each one up one by one. And I looked through the um, main menu, all the sub menus, I read all the pages on the website. I also looked at other documents on the website such as a charter or bylaws, um, if there were strategic plans or minutes from business meetings. I looked at conference, um, uh, the, 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 the conference programs, um, newsletters. I looked at every document that I could find on the website for these organizations to try to find information about students. And if there were, if there was the, the option to be able to search, I also searched for students to be able to make sure I didn't miss anything. So um, I did um, manage to collect information then on 124 organizations. Once I had that information, which I organized in a, a very large spreadsheet, um, I just did some basic descriptive statistics. You know, I will confess I am not a quantitative researcher, so I just did basic kind of um, statistics. So I'm um, looking at frequency, looking at um, the averages, looking at um, percentages, um, but really I focused on the content analysis. So what information that I could find about students on these different websites, and then trying to um, classify those into categories. And those are the, um, the categories are what I'm gonna be sharing with you today on the different ways that the associations engage with their student members. I'm not um, really monitoring the chat right now. So if there's some question, um, uh, George or someone, please let me know um, so I can go ahead and um, address it. Um, as I share my findings, there might be some occasions where I mention your association. And if that's the case, I invite you to elaborate and share more on how your association engages with student members in this way. So first, um, you know, obviously I looked, did the association have a student membership category on their application form? 77% um, of the associations out of those 124 did have a student member category. But then that also means that 23% did not have a student member category, you know, that everybody was just a member. Um, so 77% had a student member category, but membership was defined in different ways. Um, so to be able to, to um, be eligible for student membership, um, sometimes you had to be a university student, just a university student, very vague, or you had to be an undergraduate, you had to be a graduate, you had to be seeking student uh, teacher certification, you had to be full-time, you had to be part-time. There were just lots of definitions for how, um, how people could be eligible for student membership. Um, one criteria was that you had to be enrolled in a program related to language or language education. So if that's the criteria for being a student, that would exclude 
teachers who might be studying to be uh, math teachers or science teachers, but they're interested in English language learners. Um, that um, definition of student would um, exclude them from being eligible to apply. Um, also, some um, associations said that you could not be working or teaching full time. Um, so that pretty much limited it to then, um, you know, pre-service teachers who are, are full-time students. Um, so it was, it was interesting to see how um, membership is defined. Um, and I think our, our, our student membership would be defined. Um, and I think um, it's, a, it's a good um, issue that you should discuss within your association. You know, if you have a student membership, how is student um, membership being defined? Maybe you want to, you know, broaden it some ways. We know that a lot of um, teachers now um, of different subjects are, are interested in working with English language learners. And, um, and if they are studying to be a teacher in that content area, you want to um, welcome people to also join your association. So um, the student membership category, um, as for those associations that had one, 56% had a, a checkbox, you know, check if you're a student, but there was no um, need to submit any proof or evidence that you were a student. Um, but 12% said you do have to have proof that you're a student to have a student membership, but they didn't say what that proof was. Um, and then 32% um, did say very specifically to be as have a student membership, you need to submit this kind of proof. Now, the most common form of proof was a copy of your student ID card, um, but some other proof that um, some of the organizations asked for was a copy of your course schedule, copy of your transcript, a letter from a professor, advisor, or the registrar, um, having a university email, submitting a bill, a copy of your bill for your tuition, um, or an endorsement by a current member of the association. Um, so I, I think that that last one, endorsement by a current member, that could um, also be a little bit exclusive because the student might not know another member of the association. Now you might assume that their professors would be members of the association, but that's not always the case. So um, again, thinking about what kind of proof um, that, that you would want for a student membership because you wanna be able to include as many people as possible. Um, so most of the associations that had a student membership category did grant students the same rights and privileges as regular members. Um, however, there were eight of those associations um, that restricted student membership in some way. Um, in other words, the student members were not equal to regular members. Um, and here's one example, I'm not gonna say who this one is, um, but they show that student members shall be, this is a, like part of their bylaws, shall be college students at either undergrad or grad level who plan to become teachers of foreign languages and who pay applicable dues, but they shall have all the rights and privileges of active members except the right to hold office. So student members in this organization are not able to hold office. And I do think that is unfortunate because we know that one, we need as many volunteers as we can get, right? So, um, and also if we can allow students to um, hold leadership positions in the association, that's only gonna strengthen the leadership in your association as those students are going to continue in those roles over time and develop their leadership skills. So um, as I noted though, this was is very few associations that had this kind of limitation on students. Another kind of limitation um, for student memberships was that sometimes they did not always receive all the same benefits in terms of like publications that the regular members received. Um, but most associations did grant students the same rights and privileges as everyone else. Um, I did find some interesting student recruitment initiatives um, as I was reading um, about the different associations. So here's uh, an example from New Jersey TESOL, New, New Jersey Bilingual Educators. If anyone is from that group, I welcome them to um, comment on this. Um, so th this association offers a free one-year membership to students upon the recommendation of a faculty member. And this is what they had to say about it. And I really liked what they, they stated here about the purpose of the membership is to encourage student participation and to help socialize new teachers into attending and contributing to their professional organizations. And so membership in the association is one way to help new members, new teachers build their networks, learn about innovations in the field, update themselves on current policies and practices join advocacy initiatives and much more. So uh, this association 
urges teacher educators to encourage membership among their students. And you can do this by recommending each new cohort who enters your program. And so here when it says new cohort, I'm assuming it's like a whole group of new students that enter like in the fall semester, for example. So it's not just one student, it could be a whole group of students. And um, I think that's really wonderful because um, one, you know, sometimes students don't want to join if they're the only one that's doing it, but if everyone joins together, um, they're going to be uh, more enthusiastic about it. Um, also, the American Association of Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese have a, a program where they um, group have group memberships for graduate departments. So the whole department has a membership that can include a faculty member and so many students along with them. So of course the rate, the fee depends on how many students are also um, part of that membership. If it's like one to 20, 21 to 40 or more than uh, 41. So I think it's a really good strategy for teacher um, associations to be have those relationships with teacher education programs. Uh, as I said, um, you know, these are all students who are very excited to be a part of your profession. And um, the as is stated here by New Jersey TESOL, New Jersey bilingual educators, uh, participating in the professional association is a way to socialize them into what are our concerns, what are our issues, how do we talk about the 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 what the things that we do in our practice. So um, this I thought these were very um, good model programs that we should all um, be aware of. Um, so as I looked at some of the different teacher association websites, there were some websites that I could not find any reference to students at all. It was like, okay, they have a student membership, but I don't see any reference, any anything when they're highlighting their activities, they're highlighting, you know, different members. I don't see anything about student members. And um, it, it made me sad because I felt like the student members were invisible in that organization. Um, but I did find other associations that really showed how they valued student members. And I'm going to share with you some ways that they did that. So um, as I noted before, there were some organizations that restricted student members from being a part of the board of directors or participating in leadership. However, there were others um, like Hawaii TESOL here that actually have designated positions in their govern governance structure um, for student members, either in an appointed or an elected position. Um, and here you can see um, from Hawaii TESOL, um, this screenshot was taken um, a, a while ago, but you can see that there is a graduate student representative there as part of their leadership. Um, another way that um, student members can be valued is by offering awards for student members. Um, for example, um, the Arkansas Foreign Language Teacher Association has a pre-service teacher award. So we know that uh, almost every teacher association has like a teacher of the year award, right? Those are those awards are for practicing teachers. But what about our student teachers? Um, so the this award is for a student teacher and they uh, there were six associations that had awards for student teachers um, and these awards were usually based on their performance in their TESOL courses or in their teaching practice. Um, so this particular um, award that I'm highlighting from the um, Arkansas Foreign Language Teacher Association, it's called the um, McAlpine Award. And the students um, who are eligible for this award have to meet the six actual KF criteria that's listed in the program standards for the preparation of foreign language teachers. So those criteria, I have the list here, um, include um, language proficiency, so they are proficient in, in the language that they're going to be teaching. They have knowledge of different cultures. They are knowledgeable about second language acquisition processes and about the learners that they're going to be teaching. Um, they're knowledgeable about how to integrate um, standards into their planning and instruction. They are knowledgeable about assessment and they are also um, dedicated to professional development, advocacy and ethics. So um, this is one way then to value the uh, the student members is by saying you know you're not a, you're not a practicing teacher right now but you know you're off to a good start here uh, we and we want to recognize the work um, that you you've done um, a lot of organizations have member spotlight features and even TESOL International has member spotlights sometimes in their newsletters or also in social media 
Um, and I did see a few associations also highlighted student members in those member spotlight features in their newsletters or on their websites. So, um, it, you know, that they also bring of something of value to our association. The associations also allow students to contribute in some unique ways. Um, so for example, uh, one way that they can contribute is to the work of the organization, you know, the day to day getting things done. Um, so some of the associations specifically recruited students to volunteer at different events like their annual conference. So maybe they work in the registration or they go to the different sessions and introduce the speakers or count how many people are there. Um, but that is not the only way that students can contribute to the association through doing, you know, grunt work. Um, students can also contribute to our knowledge base in the profession. And so there are several ways that associations did provide opportunities for students to contribute to our professional knowledge base. So one way is by allowing students to give presentations at the conference in a, in a kind of a designated um, time slot. And as uh, most of you probably know, TESOL International does this um, by um, hosting master and doctoral student forums uh, prior to the, to the conference. Um, but some associations also gave student research awards. And an example is the American Association for Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese. Um, they, gave, they give two continuing graduate student sessions um, in, during their conference, they have these two graduate student sessions where it's graduate students present research and they are selected to present during the regular conference in these sessions um, through a competitive process. And so when they are selected, then they have their conference fee waived, they get a stipend and they are also recognized in the awards banquet. So the um, graduate students are not just, you know, shuffled over to the side, they are uh, celebrated during the conference and acknowledged for what they can bring in terms of knowledge, professional knowledge. MidTESOL also um, gives an award for best student proposal um, at their conference. And I don't, if anyone is here from um, MidTESOL, I'm happy to hear from you about that. Um, so uh, this though is a self-nominated award. So basically when students submit a proposal, there's a checkbox like, would you like to be considered for this award? Um, but that's another way um, that we can include students and recognize their intellectual contributions. Um, another way that students can contribute is through um, writing and sharing uh, through publications. Um, so for some examples here are um, the Texas Association for Bilingual Education. They have um, several student affiliates, which are called BASO, and I'll talk about those in a minute. But there's, they have a special column in their um, newsletter for the student members in BASO to share what their affiliates are doing and also to give like tips to other um, student leaders on how to manage their organizations. California TESOL has also had um, columns in their um, newsletter and in their publications with a graduate student perspective. Um, and they've also had a graduate student writing award um, a kind of competition and the the student who won wins this award is able to have their um, writing published in the California TESOL publications. Um, and a very special case that I saw was with the American Association for Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese. They have an entire journal that is uh, edited, uh, written, edited, and published by graduate student members. So um, they are able to develop a lot of professional skills that way while contributing their knowledge to our profession. The organizations that I looked at also um, try to meet students' needs in different ways. And so as I mentioned at the beginning, you know, students have a little bit different needs than other members. Um, because they are students, they might have more financial needs because they are paying tuition, they're not working full time necessarily, so um, they might need more financial support. So some different ways that the association support students financially. Um, one is through offering reduced membership fees. 77% 70, 70, um, offer reduced membership fees and 58% offered reduced conference fees. Well, it's a little bit hard to disentangle these two because sometimes um, when you are a member, you can automatically attend a conference for free 
or sometimes the membership is rolled into your conference fees. So it's a little bit hard to separate these, but these are the two main ways that the language teacher associations help to meet students' financial needs. Some of the associations offered scholarships and grants for conference attendance. Um, so sometimes that took the form of just a waiver that, okay, you can come and we just won't charge you a, a conference fee. Um, in other cases, it was actually a cash award that they received, you know, a sum of money to pay for registration, travel, hotel, and other um, expenses associated with attending the conference. Also, some of these grants were administered more on a first come, first serve basis, like here we have this pot of money, um, you know, whoever needs help, you know, apply and we'll give it to you. Um, and then in other cases, uh, the funds were administ administered through a more competitive process where students had to apply and show need, or um, in some cases, they had to be presenting at the conference themselves to be able to uh, qualify for, for this award. Um, some of the associations gave scholarships and grants for educational expenses. So what I mean by this is if they were studying for a degree um, that the association gave scholarships to pay for tuition, um, or if they were studying to get certification, um, they could pay, pay for those um, certification courses. Um, and some of the associations gave grants or scholarships for study abroad. Um, so this would be particularly true if the student is trying to develop proficiency um, in the language that they're going to be teaching. So these last two um, forms of support, the grants and scholarships for educational expenses and for study abroad, these tended to occur primarily in the associations um, for foreign language teachers, um, not so much for the um, TESOL associations. Students also have social needs, you know, they want to be able to connect with other students. Um, so some of the groups had, some of the associations had kind of subgroups that were dedicated to students. So I mentioned before BASO, which is the Bilingual Education Student Organization. So with, uh, I, one of the um, associations that I was looking at was, was the National Association for Bilingual Education. Then there are state affiliates, like I mentioned, the Texas Association. And then there are the student affiliates that are affiliated with the state group. So they have this big hierarchy. Um, so the state groups, uh, excuse me, the student groups um, in Texas, for example, there are 19 BASO student groups. They are affiliated with the state group. Um, but each of the um, student groups are located on a different university campus and they are run entirely by students. Um, but it's a, having these student groups is kind of a good way to funnel people in um, into the state group when, once they graduate and then also into the national group. Another organization, the Connecticut Council of Language Teachers, they have a future teacher honor society. Um, and so for, to join this honor society, the students had to be you know, studying for um, a major to become a foreign language teacher, but they have to have um, a GPA of 3.0 and they also have to be recommended by their professors. So this was um, something that was unique that I did not really see um, in a lot of organizations was an honor society for these future teachers that was hosted by the Language Teacher Association. Um, also, some of the associations had special interest groups that were dedicated for students, but I have to say, unfortunately, um, I did not find a lot of information about what these special interest groups for students actually did. Um, but there were several um, kinds of groups that these um, larger associations had for students. And um, also, students have career development needs. Um, they need to, to develop their pedagogical skills. They need to help finding jobs, um, knowing how to write their resumes and um, how to do teaching demonstrations and, and to um, how to act in job interviews. So um, the associations also had a role in that in, in helping to fulfill their career development needs. <clears throat> so one example is for the Texas Foreign Language Association. They have pre-conference workshops that are for pre-service teachers that cover topics such as lesson planning, classroom management, and different kinds of instructional activities. So these were, these, these were pre-conference hosted outside of the main conference, but they were special for the student members. Um, California and Nevada TESOL um, have had novice mentor wrap sessions at their um, conference, 
And these are 10 minute sessions where a student or a recent graduate is able to connect with a mentor and talk about either like issues that they're facing in their teaching or it could be um, seeking advice on you know how to get a job or just how to how to uh, advance professionally um, so they are able to provide that kind of mentorship opportunity i think i like how much can you talk about in 10 months like 10 10 minutes i think it needs to be a little bit longer but um that it's great that they have that opportunity to to connect and finally, um, the Committee on the Status of Graduate Students in the Humanities is a committee within the Modern Language Association. And I want to talk specifically about that because it seems that the Modern Language Association has really given a lot of thought to um, working uh, on behalf of students. <clears throat> and this is a statement um, that, uh, of their charge that was recently revived, revised in 2018. Um, this is a, this um, committee within the MLA has been um, enacted since 1998. So um, it's, it's been uh, in existence for a long time. And so you can see here that um, this committee on the status of graduate students considers a range of curricular, intellectual, and labor issues that affect master's and doctoral students. Um, they will advocate for the well-being of graduate students in all aspects of their educational and professional lives. They will organize conference sessions, uh, evaluate policy, create reports on experiences and best practices, um, engage in other projects that will support students while they pursue their education, uh, gain work experience, seek employment, and make a transition into the workplace. Um, they will also report on issues that concern graduate students to different um, leaders within the MLA, the executive council staff and other committees that um, have work with um, activities that affect graduate students. So, um, you know, they, they've uh, really given a lot of thought to how they can address the needs of students in their organization. And some of the things that they have done is to host um, uh, create, um, for example, for students who are going to the conference, they will have a student's guide to the conference. Um, or they will have, um, at the conference, they have a special lounge and reception for graduate students. Or they create a list of all of the different sessions at the conference that would be a benefit to graduate students as they try to transition into the workforce. Um, so they, um, they do different things to try to advocate uh, on behalf of their graduate students within the organization and within the profession. So after I have looked at all these different organizations and seen the kinds of things that they're doing to recruit and support students, um, I came up with some recommendations. Um, the first is to identify your student members, right? If you don't know that you have student members or you don't know how many student members you have, it can be difficult to really address their needs. Um, so some of you may already have a student membership category on your application form, but even if you don't have a, a special student membership category, I would recommend asking for some demographic information in that sense on your application form to ask, um, you know, what is your professional status? And for example, student, um, classroom teacher, administrator, um, retired. So even if you don't have different categories of membership, try to collect some information to know what is the professional status of your members so you can know how many student members that you have. I would also suggest keeping your association website up to date because really I looked at everyone's websites and some of them, you know, the, the information was from like 2013. Um, so keep your website up to date because if you want to recruit student members, you know, or you want to recruit members at all, um, you need to have the update information there. Um, but I would suggest, particularly for student members, is maybe consolidate all the information that pertains to students under one link or one tab. So for example, you might have under this one tab, um, you know, how to apply for student membership, what are some of the student awards that you give, um, what are some any student groups, um, just so um, just different um, resources that would be applicable for, for students. So I would say um, try to consolidate that, consolidate that information into one tab or one link so that students don't have to look all over the place to see if there's anything that pertains to them. 
Um, also, if you have the opportunity to create some kind of mentor program where you can match student members with professional category members, that can help them also to um, get acclimated to your organization to see what kinds of um, activities that they could engage in or how they could get involved to help them get started networking. Um, I would suggest assigning student members the same rights and privileges as regular members. As I, as I saw before, um, that there were a few organizations that made, you know, kind of made the, the students to be second class members, that they weren't allowed um, all the same benefits or privileges as um, other members. And so I think it's important to, to make them equal members. Um, you, want you want your student members to feel included and to feel like this is an organization that's gonna be their professional community you know, throughout their career. Um, so you want to be able to welcome them on, on equal footing and you want them to get involved um, and participate in activities and leadership and volunteering as soon as possible. Um, if, uh, as, as I mentioned before, I think it's good practice for an association to establish a relationship with the teacher education um, programs in their area. And so to that end, you might want to create some posters or booklets, even it could be, you know, digital um, posters or booklets, which describe your association and what they do, which I know most associations have that, but specifically highlighting the benefits for student members, you know, that they have a student membership. If you have awards, what are special programs for student members? Um, and then distributing those to your teacher education programs um, as a way to, um, to let students know about your organization. Uh, and to take the student members out of the shadows and put them into the limelight. Um, as I said, sometimes I felt that the student members were invisible in the organizations. So take them out and highlight them um, in your member profiles. Maybe you even want to have like a you know, student member month where you do special activities for student members and you highlight the student members it, on your website or in your social media feed. And finally, integrate the activities for student members within your larger events. Um, don't relegate the students to some special pre-service, uh, excuse me, pre-conference activity. They should be part of your regular conference because where else are they gonna meet the, the professional members, the experienced members who can serve as their mentors? So those are the um, recommendations that I have and I'd like to open it up now for some discussion. What are some um, ideas that you take away from this today? And what are some ways that your organization is connecting with student members? Thank you, Nikki. Thank you so much. Um, uh, will the people uh, volunteer and uh, call on the slide? Who do we have here? Yeah, so if somebody wants to, um, they can unmute their microphones or you can raise your hands and we can go. Uh, because I think there are lots of recommendations that were mentioned in the chat. So maybe, Gracia, would you like to tell us about how to do so? So yeah, I, I was uh, mentioning this in the chat that we make sure that we have uh, student teachers who are from both uh, public universities attend our conference and we give them a special fee for their attendance. And we also make sure and encourage them to present because we want them to have that experience. And because we have so many international free centers, we encourage them to also interact with them so they can build and create projects and collaborate. So we do mentor them and encourage them to do that. We like, we like the idea of them being the future leaders of the association. And in order for them to become those leaders, we need to encourage them to establish these collaborations. Great, thank you. Um, Miriam Lachrizi. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Nikki, for this presentation. And I really loved every recommendation of yours. So, and, and I'm also very like strong importance of involving students, you know, in, in management and in, in, in everything when it comes to EOs. But one point that I want to mention, coming from Morocco, by the way, I'm, I'm, I'm a Moroccan professor. So um, I always feel like there is this gap between um, 
whatever NGOs do and, and the Ministry of Education as a centralized, you know, um, you know, like uh, being like in a centralized country, I always see this gap between uh, what associations do and what universities do. There is no, even when we have, for example, presenters presenting for a conference, I feel like people prepare presentations for the conference. So research is not really associated with whatever um, uh, associations are doing, you know, so, and this is one reason why even in the last few years, we've noticed that a lot of university professors are no longer really attracted to present in, 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 in you know, in associations. So I think involving students is, is like in a way it can attract actually the university and research to whatever the NGOs is, are doing and also uplift the role of NGOs in any society, you know, because we don't want, I've noticed like, at least like I'm talking from our experience, sometimes um, whenever we are having like presenters from universities, people are very theoretical, you know, and we have less and less practical ideas for teachers in the classroom. So I think maybe students can be great liaison to bring the university back to, to earth, you know? Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, Daryl? Uh, kia ora kato, everyone. Um, yeah, um, George, it's not 3 a.m. It's um, it's um, 9.30 a.m., which is much nicer. Um, thanks, um, Nikki. I thought Welcome. some of those um, recommendations were really, really strong. Um, one thing that I've been thinking about for a while um, down in New Zealand um, is um, student um, direct representation. So, I'll, I'll, you know, in the university context, okay. we're very familiar so, with having student yeah, members yeah, on yeah. boards. And um, I'm just wondering whether you came across any um, teacher associations that had gone to that step of bringing student representation into um, their executives or their boards directly? Um, yes, um, as I said, there were um, nine organizations that did have a student on their board, either in, a, in a, an appointed or an elected position. Um, but I'm saying nine out of, you know, 124. So um, yeah. it's very uh, few number that have been doing that. But um, yeah, I think um, that this, it's important for developing the leadership skills and for, for students to feel like, um, you know, they are a part, part of the association, um, that they're not just, um, you know, stepchildren, that they, they are full-fledged members of the association and that they have a voice in um, what the association does and, and offers. Thanks for that. I came in halfway through, so yeah. okay. <laughs> apologies yeah, I did, for the I did mention that yeah. at the beginning. Uh -huh. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, there are there any other um, comments or somebody would like to. George, um, okay, well, yeah. um, I will say that um, that I have written a chapter on this research that was published in this book on um, the role of language teacher associations and professional development that was edited by Ayman El Sheikh, Christine Coombe and Okon Effion. So um, they will be, um, Africa Tisla will be having a panel discussion um, on, sat on Saturday, and here's the Zoom link for that, where um, some of the presenters will discuss other chapters in this book. So it's an, an, another way to follow up on some of the uh, research on language teacher associations. Thank you. Uh, and Nikki, I, I was mentioning in the chat earlier that I think it's important that you bring students into the picture of, of, of of associations at an early stage. So maybe uh, teacher associations can create, like maybe have campaigns that go and visit universities or in coordination with their um, student um, administration. I mean, they can go and present and not only seniors, I mean, not only people who are about to graduate, right. get them earlier on. I mean, because I think this is the power, this is, sorry, this is the future of the associations. If you mm -hmm. don't have students who will become members, then you'll just, you know, at some point, some people will not be interested in that. So I think nurturing that sense of community, community of practice, I think is very, very important from a younger age. Yeah, I agree. And um, when I looked at um, the information on the websites, as I said, some of the um, documents that I looked at were strategic plans or minutes from business meetings. And it came up pretty commonly that one of the goals of these different associations, one of the goals was to increase membership. Uh, so, you know, that they, they seem to be having falling membership numbers. Um, and so, yeah, I think we need to be reaching out to students, uh, letting them, you know, feel a part of our community, see the value of uh, membership in a professional association. Um, and hopefully, 
um, those students will be like me and they'll be hooked you know when they are um, early on uh, as in their student a career and then in their professional career and they will become lifetime members and leaders in your association thank you so much Nikki. Yes. you've been in TESOL I remember TESOL for how many years 20 28 years yeah Eight. good yeah. so well I've list I've listed my um, email here if anyone wants to get in touch and um, I'll let you have a little bit of a break before you have your next session start Thank you so much. All right, Indeed, thanks. we'll take take a ten minute break, and we will um, be back for our next presentation, which is uh, about our intersections. Right? We'll be back. Take a break, everyone. <laughs>